disruptors and curious minds, CEOs, founders, book lovers, readers. I'm Mark, this is Jeremy, and you're listening to the Thinking on Paper book club, where we explore, investigate, extrapolate the, the wisdom, the strategy, the insight, um, and the ideas of books that have stood the test of time, books that will change your mind, books like this month's The Order of Time by Carlo Rivelli. We're on the final straight. We're heading in to the chicanes of the last corner, <laughs> chapters 11 and 12. I'm going to hand the baton, as usual, over to Jeremy with his first thoughts. And we're back with our old friend, Entropy. Once again, Jeremy. <laughs> My goodness. Well, uh, yeah, just a reminder, reading is now a team sport. Buckle your seatbelts. As Mark mentioned, we are headed for the home stretch uh, on this on this wonderful book. Yeah, chapter 11, what emerges from a pe- peculiarity, right? So this one to me again is a is a is a discussion of of entropy but also entropy and heat and you know it's entropy not energy that drives the world and I wanted to spend some time on that paradigm a little bit because we um we part of this whole book is like understanding that we have a false sense of what time actually is so let's break down that false sense of what it is and then build it up through you know the understanding of physics that smarter people than us have that we can kind of get to. But, you know, the idea of like, man, we always need energy. We need energy to do things, energy to kind of, um, you know, make stuff happen personally, but also like how things grow in the ground, how we eat the things that grow in the ground. But the world needs low entropy, not energy. So I started thinking about a couple of things, right? I started thinking about like low entropy, when, when entropy is low, things are less chaotic. They're more formed. They're more kind of concrete for lack of a better term. This is definitely not a scientific interpretation of entropy, but my own personal, right? Right. So, so like this, this spun to like this, this idea is spinning back to the nexus, right? And we talked about uh, divergence and convergence, right? And when you're thinking big on a, a big idea, you know, you, divergent thinking explores things kind of without expectation, these serendipitous, you know, kind of chaotic connections. But then you eventually, when you focus on something, there's a convergence to like, all right, we're going to do this one thing. And I started thinking about like how low entropy is like this convergence from like thinking big into honing into something concrete. So pointing back again, in the past, entropy is low, meaning things are kind of locked in as this thing happened. Right. You know, and so that, so that's, I I, I know I'm like, I know I'm like kind of actively processing as we're always talking about, but speaking of processing, life is a network of processes for increasing entropy. Right. So in the past, there are these discrete bundles of things that have happened. Right. Entropy is low when things are kind of organized. Right. But as we move to the future, as we move from something that happened to something that potentially will happen, that's where the disorganization comes in, right? That's where things are more chaotic. That's where more options and more probabilities are set to happen because the future isn't set. The past is set. So anyway, a long story short, (laughs) entropy is back. I'm still utterly confused and um, working my way through understanding the difference between energy and empathy entropy i need Um, empathy i need empathy for all those things to happen energy entropy and empathy or all entangled in one big man my favorite question in this on the as he tries to explain entropy and energy was the question what causes stars to ignite and i i I read that and I, i never really pictured a star igniting um, I never really pictured a star being born. I mean, and so he explains it via entropy, and it's probably better if I read this rather than yeah, yeah, yeah. Point. I remember reading that too. <laughs> what causes stars to ignite? Another process that increases entropy: the contraction due to cravi- gravity of one of the large clouds of hydrogen that sail throughout the galaxy. A contracted cloud of hydrogen has higher entropy than a dispersed one, but the clouds of hydrogen are so vast that they take millions of years to contract. Only after they have become concentrated do they manage to heat up to the point that triggers the process of nuclear fission. 
The ignition of nuclear fusion opens the door that allows a further increase in entropy, hydrogen burning into helium. So it's this kind of state. Uh, then you can you can picture it. You can picture intergalactic space, huge meandering clouds of hydrogen that over millions of years come together, come together, come together, compress down, compress down, heat up, heat up, boom, stars are born. And he uses another analogy with a log of wood that you have this log of wood. So the log of wood is intergalactic space in the past. This big hydrogen cloud is no very slow. There's no movement. It's solid. The log is very solid. And just as the hydrogen clouds need something to ignite it to, to, to go from low to high entropy, so a log needs a spark to move from this solid state into flames and burn, and then the entropy speeds up. And th th those were quite visual to me, and they, they really helped me kind of, again, get my head around this idea of low entropy to high entropy. Yeah, and the the entropy thing was really interesting as he as he talked about the sun as a rich source of low entropy, and I was like, yeah, I was that like, was weird what? at the first time. That right. was weird. I was like, that makes zero sense to me. Yeah. Right? And and then, but then he starts talking about all right. So if we look at what the sun does, it sends hot photons to Earth, right? And the hot photon, one single hot photon, comes to Earth, and for every one hot photon that comes from the sun to Earth, ten cold photons are emitted back right so there's yeah. this there's this ratio of kind of a 10 to 1 and entropy is lower for the hot photons because the number of configurations for one hot photon is less than 10 cold photons so normally this is where the energy entropy thing i i think of it, i'm thinking energy when i should be thinking entropy from a sun perspective, because you go out and you stand in the sun, you, you feel the energy, you feel the heat, right? Sun is a massive amount of energy. Yes, but it also is a low entropy configuration as it relates to photons coming to the earth and we sending them back. Yeah. And and stepping it back, it's, it's a fast entropy than the intergalactic hydrogen cloud that came before it. And then, yeah, there's right. almost this ladder down as entropy speeds up. And then, obviously, it, you, just, you think you get your head around it. I've wrapped my head around entropy. Then he ta starts talking about irreversible process. Um, and in a world without heat, everything would rebound elastically, leaving no trace. Do you remember the part about the stone, he said, when yep. he said, if you dropped a stone and there was no entropy, the stone would... I, I didn't... Like, bounce? Like, just, <laughs> the, the stone would never hit the earth? I, I didn't... Did you did you understand that? Well, so it, this this boils down to, and this this kind of sends us into chapter twelve a little bit, I think. But he talks about traces, right? And traces of the past exist when entropy is low, right? And to leave a trace, something must be stopped. Something must be arrested. Stop moving, right? And when something stops moving, that force of movement turns that energy into heat, right? So when energy turns into heat. That's kind of like when things are locked in as something that happened, right? As something, you know, entropy finally settles out. The stone is on the ground, right? It's a moment you look at the stone on the ground. There's a piece of time, I guess, right? Um, that's how I. That's how I kind of got into that a little bit. Okay, like that traces kind of makes sense. Um, <laughs> so, okay, that's a good segue into into chapter twelve, which is. Um, the Secret of the Madeleine, Proust's Madeleine, an uh, incredibly famous story here in Europe, I assume. Is it an incredibly famous story in America too? No. Okay, so do you know it? So Marcel Proust wrote this very famous book essentially about <laughs> when he was older, I don't know how I, what age, he bit into a Madeleine. Do you know what a Madeleine is? No. Uh -uh. It's like this little French cake. It's about this big, okay. spo a spongy cake. And Kids love it. And basically French kids, they just eat these things like, by, by the dozen all the time. And the story is that, that Bruce, he wrote when he was at some age, he ate a Madeleine and all the memories of his childhood just like, bam, because the taste of the Madeleine just Got reminded it. him of everything that had happened when he was eating these Madeleines all through his childhood. And then he wrote a book with that, I don't know, like a thousand pages of like all these memories, um, which is why this chapter, and this chapter is about memory and this is what i was saying last week and this is my favorite chapter because i'm sure i said it last week 
we can separate ourselves from the cosmos. And in fact, time is just a construct of, of our consciousness. This is our memory. This is this. I like this chapter. I actually really liked it too. And you know, the, so it's a, a, the theme that rung true through chapter 12 was it's not about pieces and things. It's about collections and relationships between those collections and events. Right. Um, and the three things that stood out are point of view, organization, and memory. We'll get to memory right. yeah, okay. after, but you know, time point of view is like time is relative to me yeah. uh, sitting here and time is relative to you sitting where you're sitting. Right. So that's simplified. That's point of view. The organization of things is man, we, we want to separate and organize the things that we see and experience, right? To generate our reality. To, I, I wrote the word order to create order. I yeah. Mean, so we can understand things. Yeah. Yep. And, and so a couple of quotes stood out The we approximate the world by breaking it down into pieces. And then I also highlighted seeking to predict right so we take we have all these pieces that we organize but we're always like trying to use what we have as knowledge today as experience today to kind of predict tomorrow and this like that we're seeking to predict all the time is really interesting to me there was some some beautiful again his physics has found his poet it says on the front cover and i think in this chapter there was some some lovely poetry and i'll read some more of the poetry at the end but um we are not a collection of independent processes in successive moments every moment of our existence is linked by a peculiar triple thread to our past the most recent and the most distant by memory, our present swarms with traces of our past. We are histories of ourselves, narratives. I am not this momentary mass of flesh reclined on a sofa typing the letter A on my laptop. I am my thoughts, full of the traces of the phrases that I'm writing. I am my mother's caresses, the serene kindness with my father calmly guided me. I am my adolescent travels, etc., etc. And so it's this kind of piecing together of our memories that creates this almost personal relationship with time it creates time in our in our personal relative experience kind of mm. yeah yeah it's 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 that but it's also our perspective like it, it creates our lens of the world right that yeah. how we how we experience other things is based on the things that we've already seen and what hit me is really interesting too so we we, we talked about point of view we talked about um organization now let's kind of dive deeper into memory right so what we perceive is not the present i highlighted that too and i immediately thought of a um, another book that i read um about time by daniel eagleman he's a neuroscientist and he right. was the guy i think i brought this up a bunch that basically our reality is on an 80 millisecond delay and there's a little piece in our brain that acts as kind of grand central station ordering these moments and then stitching together the missing gaps based on, oh, that looks like a little bit of this. And it kind of builds our reality. And, you know, Augustine, you know, he references Augustine in this, you know, that, that time is a subjective phenomenon within all of us, right? It, and point of view makes it unique to us, right? You know, my point of view on it makes it unique to us, which is also linked to my experience and my memories and how I process is going to be different than how you process, right? Um. I just got sidetracked by um, Augustine's from the the same Augustine from the Bob Dylan track. No, oh, that. nice pull. Or, yeah, Augustine. again, your version of reality driving your train in one direction. <laughs> Love well, it. We should look at the lyrics of that song. That would be interesting if he was actually talking about time in any way. I'm gonna have a look at that later. Oh, good call. Because um, maybe you know. Hey, I got I got something for you while we're doing it. So, so let's talk about duration. Okay. Duration is like you know it's a there moments have to have duration right but how can we measure how can how can we measure two moments at the same time when we're sitting in one moment so what do you mean sorry how do you measure two moments when you're sitting in one moment so he talks about duration right and duration requires the measurement of two moments but we're always only in one moment how do you measure two moments memory and anticipation oh so, nice segue i like know. it I just like it. again it's just our 
our relation to, uh, 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 to give everything to give something meaning we need to do that link the dots yeah so memory Disru and disruptors and curious minds we didn't plan that either that was that was rather serendipitous we promise we're definitely not that scripted i promise yeah um i think they know that <laughs> they <laughs> so all right so consciousness is based on memory and anticipation like you just said right memory and anticipation this whole musical reference to me was really fascinating as it as it relates to memory, as it relates to time. And does time unfold like music unfolds? When you listen to music, music is something that unfolds in time, right? Right. And, you know, I started thinking about like, is time like humanity's organized music? And you think about how music locks in moments, right? So if I if I play, let's relate musical notes in succession to memories, all okay. right? Okay. So if I were to play four notes in succession, you know, I play, you know, the first note, okay, and I play the second note, you remember the first note, right? But you yeah. hear the second note. Yeah. And then I play the third note, you remember the second note, the first note starts to fade away a little bit, right? It might even go away, you don't remember it, the fourth note and so on and so forth. That's a really interesting analogy to memory, isn't it? It's beautiful, yeah. And I can, I can hear it. I can see it. I can, yeah, those, yeah. It's, it's that. It, that's what he alludes to, really. I, I, I knew that you'd have a professional take on the music, Jeremy. Um, what does that mean for? Does that remove the link with energy and entropy that we spoke about? Do, it, it, like, is that? Does that idea? remove the entropy and en energy and put the responsibility again on us on our brain on our interpretation of things on our insatiable desire for meaning in this weird complex ridiculous universe i think that the entropy thing is always in play i think it's that like underlying it's that underlying kind of kick kick drum that you just kind of keep hearing it's the kick and the, then the decay of the kick right oh, I like that yeah so you have you have like the past is ordered entropy right so that's when the 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 attack of the kick hits right but then new thing as you move from past into future we move from very succinct on the dot hits to um to potentials and this is where like quantum mechanics comes back in. It's like everything is a probability and like the decay of that kick drum, what's going to happen next? All right. So point back when you when I listen to music, I can only listen to certain types of music when I'm reading or when I'm concentrating on stuff. And I've actually landed on this is that this is a little hard right, but it'll make sense, I think, in a second. I listen to a lot of classical Hindustani music. And the reason why I do it is I can't predict where the song is going next. And this goes to anticipation, right? right? Okay. So if I'm listening to a pop song or like something that I know, or even Western music, it's very formulaic. So if you hear like, if you hear like a minor two, you're expecting, you know, some other resolve to happen. Or if you hear the four, you're going to expect to hear the five, right? It's just like these patterns. And I end up focusing on the music and not on what I'm supposed to be listening to. So Let's spin this back around it. Like that that's interesting, actually. That's a bit like when they when you, you can't not listen to something. And and so if you're if you're if you have music on where you Uh oh. Time has stood still. Hopefully Mark will be back. He is uh in quantum superposition right now. And uh we're gonna continue to talk about <laughs> we're gonna continue to talk about this idea of finite moments turning into probabilities. So brains are connections, right? They're connections between memory and foresight, right? And he talks about this connection being kind of our source of identity, our uh, individualism. And Mark is now back. There he is. I kept going, man. I kept going. I moved on to brains, memory, and foresight, and our source of identity. But do we want to circle back? I, I, you sound like you had a really good thought there. No, I, I'm sure that that thought, a bit like the musical notes, has has vanished into the past. Now only a memory for me, fleeting. But That's that right. was that was entropy. That was my internet connection. 
entropy in entropy, I think. Yeah, it, it locked into a moment of you not being here. Uh, and now we're moving on the probability of hopefully that not happening again. So we'll see. Um, I was just going to, since you carried on, um, I was going to just finish with the music of Strauss mm. and the words of Hoffman Thal. Um, I remember a little girl, but how can that be? Once I was that little Rezzy. And then one day I became an old woman. If God wills it, so why allow me to see it? Why doesn't he hide it from me? Everything is a mystery, such a deep mystery. I feel the fragility of things in time from the bottom of my heart. I feel we should cling to nothing. Everything slips through our fingers. All that we seek to hold on to dissolves. Everything vanishes like mists and dreams. Time is a strange thing. When we don't need it, it is nothing. Then suddenly there is nothing else. It is everywhere around us, also within us. It seeps into our faces. It seeps into the mirror, runs through my temples. Between you and I, it runs silently like an hourglass. Sometimes I feel it flowing inexplicably. Sometimes I get up in the middle of the night and stop all the clocks. That's yeah. I remember reading that too. That that's pretty amazing, man. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. And I think that I think we'll talk about, we'll wrap it up next week. But I'm happy to know, to, 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 to be at peace with this idea of two times, the time, the, the quantum time that exists or doesn't exist out there and the time in my head that's flowing. Yeah, there, well, there's an organizational time, right? There's an organi- a coordinated time. And I think, I think it's called, I mean, UTC, Universal Coordinated Time. I think it's, it's uh, that's the acronym in English. I think it's something else in whatever other language that is. But to coordinate moments between humanity, right? For the, for the object of doing coordinated things like business, like meetings, like all of that stuff. And then there's this other time that is kind of, this internal sense of ordering our traces, the traces that, that we create based on these entropy or based on these moments of low entropy, moments of low entropy. I picture a machine, like picture this machine, right? That as we're moving through our day, there are certain moments that we remember in this, this time machine, let's say just stamps low entropy moments and puts them into these little packages and they become traces in our memory, right? So those are ordered traces and then space in the onset, which tends to get coordinated with time, space, time, space, and time, time and space. Space is shaped by this external sense of how we move through the world and what we see and how we organize and order those things. And the two pieces of the puzzle are the internal traces and memories and the external things that we're seeing in our real time holy moly there you go there you go love it we've all got a time machine in our heads that's right that's right so that's right. so next so next week we will wrap up this this wonderful book we're going to continue to ask carlo Rivelli for his time he has Come on, responded carlo, to us. we need you he has responded that and he said he has no time at the moment but um maybe we can convince him by some clever physics equation to uh to join us but we'll wrap the book we'll try and give you guys kind of a um uh kind of a synthesized individual summary of what we think was important as standouts in the book and then we will announce our next book which is going to be very quantum focused i believe quantum computing focused there you go awesome right there you have it yeah that's the book club for today Stay disruptive, stay curious. Keep thinking on paper.